Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. We're actually going to have you just remain seated today, and we're going to sing this song, Graves into Gardens. Um, so as you're sitting, as you're singing along with us, uh, let's really focus on these words and sing them as a congregation together, unified. Amen? So sing this along with us. Sing this out. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures of faith, but never enough. And then you came along. afraid I'm not afraid Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Here are just a few things coming up in the next few weeks. Good morning, and welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. Here are a few announcements to add to your calendar. We will have our Back to School Bash at the Bisco Pool on August 8th. We will meet at the pool at 7 p.m., and dinner will be provided. Make sure to invite another family to join us. This event is for all ages. Hey, families. Our kids had such an awesome time at our birdhouse workshop. You do not want to miss our next family event. Kids, grades, kindergarten through fifth grade, and their families are welcome to join our flower workshop Wednesday, August 11th. We will meet at 6 p.m. at the Troy Flower and Gift Shop. This event is free. Please register for this event by texting Pastor Cameron and letting him know your kids will be attending. Everyone is invited to our family recreation night on August 29th. Stay updated for more information about this night. All ages are invited. Make sure to stay updated with everything we are doing here at Troy First Baptist Church and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, check out our website at TroyFirstBaptist.net. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Madagascar. This land of riches fights a battle with poverty. Some call Madagascar the eighth continent. Its rich environment houses unique plant and animal species and a unique mix of ethnicities but most people live on average on less than a dollar US a day. 
The slash and burn farming technique destroyed about 80% of the rainforest cover and many species of plants and animals. Pray for leadership that will serve people well and development that lifts people out of poverty. So we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray for Madagascar. That's our country this morning. Um, isn't it crazy that we're already into the M's in the countries? Uh, so that was pretty cool. Next week we'll give you an update and let you know just how many countries we've prayed for. And we'll celebrate that next week. Um, but we're going to pray for Madagascar. We'll continue to pray um, for the, our service uh, here together. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, we pray right now for the country of Madagascar. We pray for the individuals there. It's a while to think that most people live off of one dollar a day. Um, God, we pray that somehow, as you've done so many times before, that you would use intense poverty to reach those for you, to reach those for your nation. God, again, send leaders, send the equip and equip the cult. God, we love you. Be with us as we continue to serve you through song and uh, eventually through obedience. In name I pray. Amen. There's a peace I've come to know My heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow. Cry of every longing heart. 
I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. despairing cry from the waters lifting me now say am I love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me service if you'll bow with me heavenly father we come before you one more time and we pray that you would enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning god i pray that as we listen god that we would find deep inerrant obedience towards you and god with everything that we hear corrections celebrations rebukes anything from you god that we would take that to heart but also take that out these doors with us May we live as the kingdom and bring the kingdom of God to this, to this town, this country, this nation, this world. God, I pray that we would be change makers, start with our own hearts and build that to others and bring your glory and your love to all who look at us. God, we love you and we bless you and we praise you. It's your precious name we pray. And everybody said, Do you really mean it? When we ask someone that, we don't know if they mean it or not. Sometimes we hope they mean it. Sometimes we hope they don't. Wow, we say, she's not messing around. That means she means it. We say, she's serious. Or if we say, will you stop fooling around? We mean that they don't mean it. They're not serious. When we say, you can't be serious, that means we hope they don't mean it. Are you kidding me? That means we don't know if they mean it or not. Are they serious? Hey, look, having fun is great. There's nothing wrong with a little good-natured kidding. But when it comes to real life, are you just messing around? Or do you really mean it? According to the wise man in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time to laugh and there is a time to weep. There's a time to dance 
unless you're a Baptist. And there is a time to mourn. You can have a good time, but you can't dance. But when it comes time to get serious, do you know how to live like you mean it? The Apostle Paul wants you to to take him on as a life coach in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, he wants to train us in the art of living like you mean it, living life to its fullest, making your life count. Ephesians is a profound letter by the Apostle Paul from the first century, written from a prison cell to the church at Ephesus, one that he founded and still loves greatly. He spent the first half of the book, chapters 1 through 3, teaching truth. And the key word was wealth, all the riches that God has supplied in Christ, what we are and what we have. The second half of the letter, chapters 4 through 6, Paul spends applying truth, getting practical. And so he starts in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, with the word, Therefore, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you have You were called. So now we change from wealth, what we have and what we are, to walk what we do. Here's the practical part. Walking is very important. And he says walking instead of living because of at least three things, I believe. Walking entails movement. You can live and sit still. You can be stationary. You can be a couch potato. But to walk, you have to move. You have to go somewhere. It also implies direction. You have to walk somewhere. You just don't spin around to walk. You're going from here to there. And so walking connotes that you're going somewhere. It also implies a third thing, and that's discipline. You are not running. You're not skipping. You are not broad jumping. You are taking one step and then another. Your Christian life is a walk. It's not a sprint. If it's a sprint for you, you're not going to last long. And so he tells us to walk and walk worthy of the calling that we saw in chapters 1 through 3. Then we saw last week, in the middle of chapter 4, he moved to a different discussion. First he talked about living lives of peace. And then in the last half of chapter 4, he talked about walking in lives of holiness. So I say, therefore, verse 17, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So there we see the key word, therefore, and we see the key word, walk. And so we looked last week at the second half of chapter 4, and we talked about breaking a bad habit for good. To break a bad habit for good, you have to want something new, and then you have to do something new. And we saw last week the replacement principle. God never tells us to stop doing one thing without telling us to start doing something in its place. And emptiness is not ideal. We need to replace the bad habits with good habits. And we learned a lesson from our shampoo bottles, those of us who get to use shampoo. The shampoo bottle says lather, rinse, and repeat. We turned that into three R's. Repent, replace, and repeat. And I ask you to remember those three R's every time you wash your hair for the rest of your life. But now in chapter 5, we come to another chapter that starts with therefore. Ephesians 5, 1 says, therefore be followers of God as dear children. And again, our key word, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. He tells us, to walk three times in chapter 5. Walk in love, verse 2. Verse 8, walk as children of light. Walk in light, as God does. And then he tells us in verse 17, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. If we are going to be followers of God, in verse 1, if we're going to be imitators, children are natural mimics, right? You watch a little child And it's so cute. They try to do everything you do. They can't do it. But they are natural imitators. You ever see a child try to walk in an adult shoes? I remember. I mean, just this week, I got to see one of my grandchildren trying to walk in my big shoes. I remember my son, who's now expecting his third child, walking in his mother high heels when he was. And that was a trick. Even I can't do that. Children imitate naturally. We're children of God. We're supposed to imitate, and we do, but sometimes we imitate the wrong people. And we are supposed to be imitating God. So we need to walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. And that is Paul telling us how we can live like we mean it. First, let's 
the serious life coach tells us in verses 1 through 7 to walk in love, connect with other people like you mean it. You see, life is more than just survival or even getting ahead. Because each one of us are children of God and made in the image of God. That means we are made to be social. We are made to connect with each other. We are made for love. God made, it, made us for him to love us and us to love him, but also that we could love each other. Jesus said the way they will know we're his followers is by the way we love each other. And he commands us to love one another here in verse 2. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us. Remember Jesus said love one another and love each other as I have loved you. A tremendously high pattern. But he tells us we are to love as he did. And how did he love us? He gave himself for us. And that's what he says husbands are to do when they love their wives. Later in this chapter, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Folks, this is not a suggestion. This is not an elective deluxe option for super Christians. It's a command, an absolute necessity for no, no kidding around serious life. If you think you are a rock or an island that you don't need anybody, you would be sadly mistaken. You need others and not just to use them or be codependent on them in the society, but to really connect with, to love them, and to love them in a godlike, self-sacrificing way. I find my definition of love in another letter of Paul's, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, not 1 Corinthians 13, but 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul says to the Corinthians, I do not seek yours, what you have, but I seek you, what I have to give you. I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly, here's the three words, I love you, the less I am loved. Here I see three parts to love. Love is selflessness. I don't seek what you have to give me. I seek what I have to give you. He doesn't say, I love you because you are so wonderful, because you are so cute. They're not. He loves them not because of what they have to offer him. He loves them because of what he has to offer them. Ask not what someone can do for you. Ask what you can do for them. Love is selfless. It's not selfish. And then what love does, it's an action. It's not a feeling. It's not a feeling that comes and goes. It is giving. I will gl very gladly spend what I have and be spent, spend what I am for you. In one word, love is giving. It's selfless giving. Jesus loved himself and gave himself for us. We know John 3, 16, right? God so loved that he gave. Love is giving. And so it's not I love you, so give to me what I want. Go to bed with me. It's I love you, so I will give of myself. I want to give myself for you. Again, that is a Strict contrast to today's brand of selfish taking love. And then to really define it, it's not only selfless giving, but even though the more I love you, the less I'm loved back, it's not a strings attached expectation thing. It's selfless giving with no expectation of return. Paul says, I'll keep on loving you even if you don't love me back. It's not you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's not I love you until you hurt me. I love you until I find somebody else. I love you, we say at the altar, until death do us part. This is my definition for love from 2 Corinthians 12. It is selfless giving with no expectation of return. That is a love like you mean it. And that's the self selfless giving positive love that does have some negative kind of implications. For instance, in verse 3, if you walk in love, verse 2, then you won't be involved with fornication, all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. If we are selflessly giving to each other, we will not be taking someone else's innocence. We won't use their bodies as an object of our own lust. We won't want their bodies or their things. Let it not even be named among you, he says. This is the opposite of real, no kidding love. Love like you mean it. Verse 4 continues, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Don't even kid about it. Folks, sex is serious business. It is a good gift from God. It is beautiful and holy, and it's not to be dragged into the gutter. It's not funny, 
to kid about. It's not fitting. It's beneath you. And here's the replacement principle we learned about last week. It's not don't stop talking altogether. Rather, it's giving thanks. Use your mouth for something positive, not negative. Walking in love means watching what you say, doesn't it? Verse 5, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater. Wow, covetousness is idolatry. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Don't let your life be characterized by all this stuff, by fooling around talk and fooling around relations. Notice coveting is idolatry, putting things before God. Well, putting things or sex before people is not love. And people who don't look anything like their father, who don't act anything like the father, who don't care about what the father does or imitating the father, he says, frankly, aren't related to the father. So they don't have an inheritance from the father. It's not that these things make you go to hell. You are evidence that you are going to hell because you are not like the father. You understand these so-called negative thou shalt nots are not legalistic prohibitions, but actually are just the opposite side of the coin of important positives. They're the first half of the replacement principle we talked about last week. Don't do this, but love. As Paul says in Romans 13, 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. That's what it doesn't do. Love gives selflessly, but if you give selflessly, you won't do harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If you really love someone, you won't break any of those commandments. You won't be... You don't need someone to tell you don't steal if you're selflessly giving to someone. If you love your spouse, you won't cheat on them. If you love your brother or sister, you won't lie to them. If you love your neighbor, you won't steal from them. If you love your brother or sister, you won't gossip about them. It's pretty simple, isn't it? You can get rid of a whole long list of don'ts with just one do. Love. Love selflessly giving. Walk in love. He continues in verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, there's a therefore again, do not be partakers with them. Don't let anyone fool you with this fooling around lifestyle. Life is serious business, so don't mess around. Live like you mean it. Don't mess around and throw away the only life that you get. Live like you mean it. And to do that means that you are going to love like God. If you're going to be a follower of God, verse 1, then you're going to walk in love, verse 2. You're going to love like God does. Let me tell you the story of Katie Fisher. Katie Fisher was at the county fair in Madison County selling her prize lamb. She was selling it because she needed to raise money for her cancer treatment. Katie was dying of lymphoma. Word spread throughout the fair that the parents were hoping that someone would be generous and give her more than the prize lamb was really worth. At that time, it was worth about $2 a pound on average. But someone came up knowing the situation and offered her eleven fifty a pound and gave her a lot of money. But the story got better when they took the lamb, gave her the money, and then gave her the lamb back and said, sell it again. And so, paying it forward, someone else came along and paid a little bit more than eleven fifty a pound and gave the lamb back, and word spread. A chain reaction, another family came, bought it, gave it back, then another. Then businesses joined in. Katie says the first sale was the only one she remembers. The rest, she was just crying too hard. The last buyer gave the lamb back too, and Katie raised $16,000 and still got to take her lamb home. Folks, that's no kidding around, selfless giving with no expectation of return love, the kind that God says makes life worth living. That's living like you mean it. That's what God wants us to do every day. We not only want to walk in love and connect, we also want to walk in light in verse 8. Paul says, second, to live like you mean it, you need to walk in light, behave like you mean it. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So here's the key word again, walk as children of the light. You were in darkness, but you are the light of the world. Jesus tells us that in the Sermon on the Mount. Notice it's not negative. Don't walk in darkness. No, it's positive. John three nineteen says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. They have something to hide. 
But notice this is positive. The replacement for walking in darkness is walking in light. So why is walking in light better than walking in darkness? Paul gives us at least three reasons. And the first one is because light produces good fruit. He says, walk as children of the light, verse 8, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Light produces fruit. Now, light doesn't produce fruit all by itself, right? Light needs a seed, and it needs some water and some soil and a plant. But unquestionably, goodness, righteousness, and truth are good things, aren't they? We all learned in grammar school that fruit, vegetation, and all life comes from light in a process we call photosynthesis. Plants convert sunlight into energy, into growth, and produces fruit which contain seeds. And the seeds help the plant reproduce. When we bask in the light, we derive spiritual energy, we grow, and we bear spiritual fruit which ends up reproducing ourselves. That's what Christ wants us to do. Bask in the light and produce fruit. Darkness doesn't produce anything. Satan doesn't build anything. Did you ever notice? He just tears down what God builds up. Evil doesn't accomplish good. It knocks buildings down, doesn't build business and make jobs. Light and good do good things. Evil tears down those good things. So if you want your life to mean something, you want to know messing around, live like you mean it life, then you need to be productive with your life. That means walking in the light and producing good things. The second thing that light does, Paul says, it discriminates good and evil. You have to turn the light on to see, right? Proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Light not only brings life, but it brings vision. If it weren't for the sun, our eyes would be worthless. We need to turn the light on to see if our clothes match. You might think I got dressed in the darkness this morning. Maybe you've gotten up in the middle of the night and didn't turn the light on to not wake up somebody else and you found the corner of the dresser there with your toe and then had to try and be quiet rather than turn the light on. You ever tripped on something in the darkness? Why is walking in the light better? There's no argument, right? Walking in the light is a lot better when you can actually see where you're going. So you can avoid the wrong path, right? Suffer less casualties. Darkness leads to missteps. Darkness leads to pain. Light leads to confidence and success. So do you want your life to mean something? You want to know messing around life to live like you mean it? You need to know where you're going, and that is what walking in the light is, to actually get there. And the third thing that light does is light exposes and it kills evil. Expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what light does. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. To do that, you need not to preach against people on street corners. You just need to be light wherever you are. I remember my wife and I in our very first apartment. We had a terrible time with these little bugs, the bug that we dare not mention their name. My wife calls them by the C word, not cancer, but cockroaches. Every morning when we would go down to the kitchen and turn on the lights, we would see them scatter. None of you have ever experienced that, I'm sure. You ever notice that cockroaches scatter in the light? You ever notice that mold and mildew don't flourish in the light but in the darkness? Notice that you have to power wash the side of the house that doesn't get any sunlight. Light not only brings life and vision, but it brings health and healing. It kills germs and infections. God's light will do that to sin in your life. Yes, darkness does produce one thing, unwanted gross infection. But light brings life and vision and health. So if you want your life to mean something... You want to know messing around life to live like you mean it. You need to be free of the destructive power of the infection of sin in your life. And that means walking in the light to expose and kill evil. In 1 John 1, John says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk, there's our key word, in darkness we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Walk in light, and you will be cleansed from sin. So verse 14 closes out this section 
with another practical second half of the book, Therefore. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is a quote from Isaiah. He says, Christ will give you light, what you need to produce, energy in life, to see where you're going, to enjoy health and healing. If you imitate God as a child of God, if you walk in light, then you will live like God. You will not only love like God, you will live like God. If you are a parent of children grown or still in school, you probably have gone through the joy of school projects. One of my favorite ones was uh, when one of my children couldn't decide what their science project ought to be, I suggested because I thought they consumed a little bit too much Mountain Dew, that we ought to get three plants, feed one water, feed one milk, and feed one Mountain Dew, and see which one flourished. I figured the one with water would grow, the one with milk would get big muscles, and the one with Mountain Dew would get all jittery. But um, what we noticed was that all three of them suffered, even the one with the water, so I wasn't very good at proving my point to my child. Then we noticed, oh yeah, all three of them were in the dark. When I finally moved them to the light, the one with the water being fed to it actually did flourish. The one with milk didn't get muscles, but it survived. The one with the Mountain Dew, the sugar and the caffeine and the artificial coloring and the acid killed it. But taking it away from the light will do the same thing. If you want life in your life, if you want to live like you mean it, to live like God, you need to walk in the light. And then Paul says third, Your life coach, Paul, says, verses 15 through 17, what you need to do is walk not only in love and connect and walk in light and behave, but you need to walk in wisdom and think like you mean it. Verses 15 through 17, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, walk in wisdom, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Notice there's our therefore again. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Therefore, and walk a third time. Walk in wisdom, yet another practical piece of advice. So what does that mean, Paul? Well, he gives us a way to understand what wisdom is. First, wisdom, real no fooling around, wisdom is alert, not reckless. He says, walk circumspectly. We know what a wise person is. We know what a foolish person is. Circumspectly is a little bit stranger. It's a big word. It's one you would do well to impress friends and family with. Circumspectly comes from two Latin words. And circum, you kind of know. Circum means around. So a circumference means around the circle. If you circumvent, you go around something. If you circumcise, you cut around. And the word spect, you kind of know because when you inspect something, you look into something. When you retrospect, you look back on something. When you expect, you look forward to something. When you spectate, you just look at something. So it means, literally, looking around. Pretty good advice to look where you're going, right? Paul says, hey, wake up, look where you're going. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3, the wise man says, a prudent man foresees evil. How? By walking circumspectly and hides himself. Instead of stepping into the manhole, the wise person looks ahead and sees the manhole and goes around it or steps over it. The simple pass on and fall down into the manhole. They are punished. If you try to text while you are driving, you may not only crash your car, but you may take someone else's life. If you try to read while you're walking, you may hurt yourself. You might walk right into a disaster. That's foolish, but Paul says watch where you're going. If you want your life to mean something, if you want to know fooling around life, live like you mean it, then to stay out of the ditch, walk in wisdom, which is alert, not reckless. Know where you're going. And second, he says, wisdom is efficient, not wasteful. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, redeeming is a financial term. I remember it from redeeming green stamps. Kids don't even know what green stamps are. They think they're postage stamps that are worth 55 cents. You redeem them by turning them in to get some kind of reward. We think now someone being redeemed is being saved. Re means over again. Deem means value. It means to literally buy back. Buy back the days, so make the most of a day. Why? Because the days are evil. What does it mean by days are evil? Well, the days are short, right? 
And the older a person gets, the more they talk about, boy, time goes by so fast. The younger you are, the more immortal you think you are. You've got all the time in the world. The older you are, you know they're wrong. We only have a short amount of time on earth. There's only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We have this moment to hold in our hands and to touch as it slips through our fingers like sand. As James says in chapter 4, our life is but a vapor. Be wise like Joseph who didn't waste his time in Egypt but redeemed the time. Or as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Time is short. Pretty morbid, right? So do what you do to the fullest. Make the most. Don't waste the time that God has given you, but be efficient, producing as much as you can while you can. Because if you want your life to mean something, if you want no fooling around, live like you mean it life, then you've got to give it all you've got, like Colossians 3.23 says, do it heartily, do it with your might. Walking in wisdom means wholeheartedness. And third, wisdom is obedient, not ignorant. He says, do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Know what the will of the Lord is and obey it. Now, sometimes we imagine that the will of God is hidden, and especially young people as they're thinking about school or a mate or a job or a calling. I'm praying for God's will in my life. God's will is not a secret. You don't need to find it because it's not lost. It's right in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. This is the will of God. you got a pen, write it down, your sanctification. You know what God's will is for your life? He wants to make you like Jesus. That's God's will. It may be one school or another. It may be one mate or another. It may be one occupation or calling or another. But God's will for your life is to make you like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to think like Jesus, to be wise and understanding, obeying his will, to have your life mean something, to live like you mean it. You need to know where God is leading and then go there. Know what God wants you to do and do it. That's walking in wisdom. Knowledge and education are about knowing what to do. Wisdom is doing it. Not fooling around, but doing it. So imitating God in verse 1, God is wise. So we need to walk as followers of God. God circumspectly walk in wisdom. That's real life, living like you mean it. So what is the key to life? A life that you live like you mean. I remember years ago, I think I've told you before, I was walking along the boardwalk at the beach when I first saw it. It was a t-shirt that said profoundly, what if the hokey pokey really is what it's all about? And I laughed out loud, and as I walked down the boardwalk and I looked back, I got, where do I get that t-shirt? I haven't found the t-shirt yet, but I've got a bumper sticker and it's in the front of my Bible. What if the hokey pokey really is what it's all about? Here's the key. Have you ever heard the little children's song, you do the hokey pokey? And so as I'm walking down the boardwalk, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, the, the line in the song says, that's what it's all about. How presumptuous to assume that life is all about a silly little children's dance. But then I went through the words of the children's song. You put your right foot in, you put your right foot out, and then you shake it all about, and you put your backside in, your backside out, and we're Baptists, so we don't shake that all about. But then I remembered the last verse. You put your whole self in, that's what it's all about. The hokey pokey gets it. I don't know if you know that the uh, author of the song Hokey Pokey died a few years ago. It made the headlines because when the undertaker put him into the coffin, left foot first, and the left foot came out. No, that's, that's not true. <laughs> the hokey pokey is not what it's all about, but putting your whole self in is what it's all about. So whatever you do, even if you dance, dance like you mean it. When you go out on the playing field, if you want to win, you better play like you mean it. When you step into the workplace, if you want to keep your job, you better work like you mean it. And when you come back home, if you have a spouse and you don't want to spend the rest of your life alone, you better love like you mean it. If you have a child who will imitate you whether you want it to or not, you better behave like you mean it. And when you are tempted to blow your stack or to compromise your life, you better watch where you're going and think like you mean it. 
When you get out of bed tomorrow to face your day, don't mess around. If you want your life to count, make it count one day to Christ, one day at a time, and follow Christ like you mean it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you meant it. You came and you died for us. You didn't just say, I love you, but you showed us. You gave yourself. You gave your only begotten son. Lord, help us, your followers, to love you like we mean it, to love each other like we mean it, to live like we mean it. Lord, if there's one here today who's never trusted in Christ as their Savior, I pray that today, right now, where they're seated, they might accept your gift of salvation by faith as it is offered to us freely. It's not of works, lest any should boast. And I pray they might say something like this in their heart to you and mean it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I deserve death and hell for my sin against you. But I believe you died in my place. Come into my heart and my life. Forgive my sin and make me the person you want me to be. I really mean it. With your head still bad, if you prayed that prayer this morning and you really meant it, if you would like to pray with somebody, Cameron or I would love to pray with you here at this altar. If you have questions, you haven't settled that yet, we'd love for you to settle it. If you'd like to join the church and follow Lord and Believers Baptism next week, if you'd like to step forward and take that challenge, we'd be glad to pray with you. Let's stand together and sing. What's the name of the song, Manya? Let others see Jesus in you. Let's sing together. Let others see Jesus in you.